All right, the number seems to be holding steady, so let's get started. Um, thank you everyone for joining this panel where we'll focus on the challenges of attracting uh, and screening qualified uh, uh, candidates in a hyper-competitive environment um, where there's talent scarcity um, and unprecedented demand for technical resources and resources overall. Um, I'm Ben Walker from Glider. Um, Glider is a candidate screening automation solution, that includes bulk um, online and mobile candidate screening, as well as skills assessments and one-way and two-way interviews. Um, so thanks for joining this session. I am joined by a fantastic panel of experts um, representing different uh, cross-sections of the talent acquisition space. So um, first, James Simmons is a uh, vice president of talent acquisition at DroneUp, which is um, a very cool, innovative uh, company that focuses on drone uh, delivery services and flight services. And I'm joined by Megan Smith, who's a vice president of uh, strategic partnerships at Modus. And Modus is one of the largest IT um, staffing and consulting firms in the world. They've got uh, about 30,000 employees and about 10,000 customers across 20 different countries. And I'm joined by Marin Henderson um, from Pontoon Solutions. So Marin Henderson is a, a program director um, in the MSP solution for Pontoon. And Pontoon is a leading provider of MSP um, recruitment experience outsourcing, total talent and services procurement solutions. So looking forward to a great session. Thanks for joining. Um, just a little housekeeping. You can send in, uh, if, if this is your first session you've attended, you can send in questions. I'll um, do my best to pivot between the panelists' questions and questions coming in from the audience. And uh, certainly at the end, we should have plenty of time so that I can start fielding some of those questions if I have missed them. So please use that uh, Q&A functionality. And so first, um, I just want to uh, kind of sort of tee up the topic here of uh, what we're what we're covering. So for context, um, anyone that's in this space today knows that we are in really unprecedented times. Um, a lot of dynamics at play here where um, between uh, just incredible rise in digital transformation initiatives um, uh, coupled with a lot of job hopping that sort of started with COVID may be here to stay for a while, baby boomer retirements. There's all these dynamics at play um, causing um, significant talent scarcity. And so the qualified candidates often already have a, a job and, and how do you attract those folks? And then the other dynamic that we'll talk about is how do you guard against um, having folks who really aren't qualified or only marginally qualified come in. They might look good on paper. They might have great credentials, a great CV, but then you discover that they really don't have the skills um, that they that they need. So um, some of the d data bears this out. And again, I think uh, folks who are on this are probably living it out uh, every day, but just for a little bit more detail and context, um, the, the JOLTS report, uh, which is the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, report that comes out every month, um, this summer, at some point, it hit an all-time high of job openings. I think it was around 11 million, and then um, it, it came down a little bit. But I think we're still north of 10 million job openings. And within the tech sector, the job openings year over year doubled um, with, for, for, for technology positions. And so a couple other anecdotes that we're hearing about, um, I was talking to one of our customers who mentioned that year over year, their requisition volume tripled. And then recently I was talking to a customer uh, at the beginning of this new year. And she said, you know, normally the first week in January, people are sort of getting their footing under them, catching up from the holiday. And it's a pretty quiet week. Um, they got a thousand requisitions um, within that first week. And so um, we're seeing this in our data as well. So from 2021 to uh, sorry, 20 to 2021, um, we saw, um, actually, sorry, 21 to 22. So first week in January of 22, we saw a 10x increase in the number of people who are inviting candidates to take assessments, skills tests in our platform. So um, that is the challenge um, that that everyone who's in this space is experiencing right now. And essentially, you know, we hear um, variations of the same theme from across uh, all of our customers and prospective customers. We have to find and, and screen more candidates faster while being mindful of the candidate experience and, and without camp compromising candidate quality. So there's this, uh, this bifurcation or this juxtaposition between got to do it fast with an unprecedented amount of volume without compromising the quality or the rigor of that screening process. 
So um, I want to kick it off uh, for the panel. We've got five topics, um, and we'll cover a few questions per topic. But Megan, um, I, I assume some of this resonates with you, and, and you and Modus are seeing this. Um, uh, can, any anecdotes or specific examples? And then specifically, how are you um, making sure that that top of your candidate funnel is big enough to, to get enough qualified candidates through the bottom of the funnel? Sure. Thanks. Thanks for the question, Ben. You're absolutely right. Uh, the talent shortage is there and we have seen a demand uh, greater than I've ever seen in my career, to be quite honest. Modus has seen substantial year over year growth in job orders. In regards to just widening the funnel, we're looking at more than just the must haves on candidate resumes and when we're talking to candidates. So it's more around culture fit. Um, what might be some of the soft skills that clients are looking for? Adaptability, problem solving, collaboration, dependability. We're also looking at previous applicants that maybe we haven't talked to in some time and um, weighing heavily on candidate referrals. And then another cool thing that MODIS has going on is MODIS Academy. So we um, like to look for candidates that are maybe an 80% fit to a client. And then we're using MODIS Academy to upskill those candidates for the client. That's fantastic. I'd love to ask you a little bit more about, about that later. Um, Great. So James, you're relatively new to drone up and, and I know drone up is in hyper growth mode and you're sort of building as you're going. Um, what, what are you doing as you build out your team to make sure that you have the um, capabilities to really ensure a solid talent type uh, pipeline? Yeah. So we have, we have two things going on. One, we have a somewhat new and emerging skill set in drone pilots um, that, you know, there are a ton of them out there, but they are not typically working full time. They're, they're usually doing some, kind of side hustle job, weddings, photography, some type of um, work in the in the kind of commercial space, maybe with uh, power and utility companies. But uh, so there's that component. And then we have the traditional component because we have got IT and, and all of the other jobs that come along with uh, our growing departments, um, IT, finance, et cetera. And so um, we're using Glider. We're using a bunch of different tools to kind of assist us with um, finding both finding the talent, but also then the ability to assess whether or not they're they're skilled. And one of the things is, you know, Ben, that we're doing with with the pilot side of the house is we're building our own uh, pilot assessment um, through Glider, and that will allow us to um, to to rate and um, rank for for lack of a better way um, pilots and their skill sets and, and their overall experience and how that correlates to the roles we're trying to fill uh, for our delivery arm. And so it's been. It's been a, an interesting market because on that side of the house, it's not as uh, hot, um, meaning we are not as competitive for talent in that world. We've got a lot of pilots that are interested in doing different things. But then you've got the flip side of, of traditional IT, marketing, finance type roles where we are having trouble finding the right talent and then finding talent that's interested in, in making a move. Uh, potentially to a new company, we're looking at more passive candidates in that space and trying to then assess what that what that looks like overall. Yeah, it's a really interesting group of uh, folks. We uh, I, I got a chance to meet uh, some of your your drone pilot recruiters, and um, uh, it's, it's it's fun working to identify new requisitions or new skills assessment tests for skills we haven't seen before. Um, and you know, I guess. This is similar to what we'll talk about a little bit where where um, someone might have dabbled in software development or a, a coder, but that might not make them qualified. There's probably right. lots of people out there who are hobbyists as drone pilots um, uh, that, that may, may not be someone you want to bring in. And, you know, there's not just can you operate the, the hardware, but um, uh, do you know the FAA regulations, for example? So there's, there's layers to it. And um, so I know that's going to be fun to, to build that out. Um, so, Marin, you uh, your pontoon programs, uh, many of them have really high volume um, globally of of requisitions, um, and you're reliant on a on a, a, a portfolio of staffing agencies and consultancies to help you fill those roles. So, have you had to make any adjustments in your teams and your programs to make sure that you have sufficient candidate volume um, flowing through to meet this demand? Yeah, thanks, Ben. I think running MSPs, you're always challenged with managing the balance of, you know, quantity and quality. And um, I think what's always the most important for us from an MSP perspective is being able to obtain any sort of forecasting we can from the client and being able to pass that back to our supplier partners so they can really move from that reactive way of recruiting to more proactive 
which helps them kind of keep that pipeline of qualified candidates going. Um, so if you've worked with an MSP before, you know forecasting is not the easiest for us to get. It's not always something that we readily have. Um, but when we do, it's super important to share that down the line. Um, for us, our teams, keeping them connected with our clients, with uh, key stakeholders, having those regular connects can, you know, maybe they're not thinking about a project that comes up, but just off the cuff conversations, something pops up and we can bring that information back. Um, and on the flip side, you know, our supplier partners, as they're having conversations with clients and with their candidates, if they hear about a ramp or a project coming up, they share that back with us. And then that allows Pontoon to get with the manager, get in front of it, set expectations. Um, aside from everybody waiting for a rec to drop in our VMS, they needed the candidates yesterday and we're all scrambling. Yeah, I, um, I have spent some time um, running an MSP program and, and also working with lots of them in a consultant uh, capacity. And I would say the whole, whole other discussion topic perhaps, um, but that forecasting of contingent labor always um, often seems like it's an afterthought thought for organizations who have hard enough time projecting talent needs on a full-time basis. Um, so that makes it particularly hard when you're not sure what what's coming. You have historical data, but um, things change rapidly um, uh, and, and hard to respond to. So, you know, yeah, you have... well, you know, too, I was just thinking, you know, it's not even always just the project, but even if a manager knows a handful of PEGA developers or, you know, just even little that may seem insignificant to them. But for us, I mean, that is really huge that we can share that back. So, um, you know, it's up to us to really educate that those are the kind of things that might seem insignificant from a client perspective, but for our staffing partners, it's invaluable. Gotcha. Yeah. So last question on this topic, I'll, I'll throw it out to any of you. And, and if, if you have an answer, fantastic. If not, we'll move on to the next topic. But I'm curious if um, any of your organizations, and James, I alluded that you're building yours as you go, but ha have you had to rethink the process and automate where you used to do something manually or cut out steps that you realize aren't adding value, but something to get that screening process, the sourcing and the screening process done more quickly? Yeah, no, a hundred percent. So we are, um, we're faced with the talent challenge of finding recruiters in this market, right? So everybody in there um, in, in this world is probably challenged with that. And so we are, um, we are as well. And so we're looking at ways to automate the, the application process a little bit better. We're using, utilizing our ATS a lot more. Um, we've hired actually some internal folks to develop out the APIs and connectors with our other, um, with our other applications that we use a lot to ensure that, including Glider, to ensure that um, we can automate steps that, that uh, frankly, a recruiter or a manual process would have otherwise done. And, and that's, just, that's just the reality of the world we play in right now. Even if I had the number of recruiters that I wanted, um, I think we'd still be, given how fast we're growing, how many people we're looking for, we'd still be struggling with, um, with without automation for sure. Gotcha. Yeah, and I would tie into that too and just say, you know, from our perspective, we're using a lot of AI for search and match. Um, and then, the, you know, the PRA, the RPA process too for pre-screening candidates and then Glider for, um, you know, just getting candidates tested in advance so that we've got a pipeline built for, you know, recs as they're coming out. Fantastic. So um, skip to a, a, a subtopic here, and that is with this challenge of finding the right talent, um, where often folks who are qualified and proficient are already on an assignment or have a job. Um, and with this unprecedented demand for, for technical resources, we're seeing um, this cohort, and this is bearing itself out in the Glider data, of, of folks who are sort of not qualified, frankly, <laughs> to, uh, to be in the space. So the good news is there's lots of options now for people to upskill, particularly in technical skills. They can take online courses, and that's fantastic. But ultimately, there's going to be a group of people that just don't have the aptitude and, and aren't going to be proficient, or at least not yet. Um, so in, in the Glider uh, platform, we have assessment functionality that includes the ability to, to monitor, automate, automate sort of the proctoring functionality. If you think of someone um, taking a test in a testing center or a classroom and there's someone there sort of making sure everyone's doing what they're supposed to do, 
um, in this distributed remote workforce that we're in today, um, our proctoring functionality um, automates that. Um, but with that, we can see that we uh, we saw a 92% year over year increase in our um, monitoring triggers. Um, so indications that someone's cheating. So that could be someone sitting next to them and you hear that voice in the room and someone's asking someone to help answer the question for them, use of their phone, opening up a browser tab to search for an answer. Um, and so uh, I've, I've been with Glider for almost six months now. I was in the contingent workforce space for, for over 20 years, but uh, for, new to the skills assessment. And I was astounded at some of the stories that I heard. It seems like every, every call that I was on um, for my first couple of weeks and talking to companies, I was hearing a new story of, of wow, you wouldn't believe this one. We have a challenge here with with testing integrity and and um, people not getting help on this test. Well, one of my favorites was, um, I think it was an interview, and this was a company that wasn't using Glider yet, and they were talking to us about our our solution. But um, there was an interview where they're doing a two, live two way interview, and the candidate apparently had someone either in the room or on a remote computer with the speakers on, who um, you know the the interviewer would ask the question. Somebody else was answering the question, but the candidate was lip syncing. And um, I've heard this more times than you will probably imagine. Um, but the the particularly funny or sad, depending on your perspective, one that that uh, I recall uh, is that the candidate forgot that they were supposed to be lip syncing. So <laughs> they're in the middle of this interview and there's somebody else giving the answers and they just sort of zoned out and they're just staring at, at the camera. Um, so we see lots of this um, and it's a challenge. And so um, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm curious, I'll pose this question out to all of you. Is it, does this resonate with you and do you have any good, bad or ugly, um, uh, examples of your own? I'll jump in again. <laughs> I, and being in this industry for 20 years, uh, I tell people all the time, I think I'm going to write a book when I retire. There's too many great stories. So we've got two stories that I kind of pitched this out, um, specifically with Glider, which as you know, and those of you that use Glider, um, it is a proxy. And, and as you log in to take the test, it asks you to use the camera. It also asks you to use um, the mic so that it can track. We had a candidate that actually stood up in the middle of the training or after the, the skills assessment for about 15 minutes and had a new person come in and sit down. So clearly they had just completely forgotten. <laughs> that they had agreed to use the camera. Um, and we also had a candidate that actually was doing a face-to-face -face interview, so pre-COVID, that came into one of our offices and was super fidgety about what she was doing. Um, we started asking her some you know, in-depth technical questions and she finally kind of put her hands up and said, I'm really sorry, this is actually my husband's resume and he's in the car if you want me to grab him. <laughs> so, I mean, it's like, I don't know where this stuff comes from, but it's pretty wild. <laughs> wow. Ours is much less, uh, but yours, you win the stories there. You, both of you guys do. But we've we've just started using Glider last year uh, as part of me bringing it for my prior role and and coming here and and really just seeing it again. We don't have it for the pilot side, but we have it for the other areas that that we've been using it. And we just see a lot of candidates pick up their phone, which I think is a very natural thing to do, and begin the process of googling the answer or figuring out whether or texting something maybe phoning a friend i'm not sure um on on the old who wants to be a millionaire but we've we've had that happen we've had um we've had people quit right in the middle um get exasperated and kind of quit uh through the process and we, you know when we follow back up with them we we ask them okay what's the particular reason that you that you jumped out and and they just said hey we i don't really understand the role i don't really understand the skills needed and as a result i just felt like it was best for me to for me to kind of move out and so it's been a it's been a huge help for us um overall it's been a little bit frustrating because as you as staffing uh coming from the staffing space and coming from a job here that my job is to make sure that we get candidates through the process um, there's a frustrating component to it, which is uh, we're, we're dropping a lot of candidates at the beginning, but that's really what we're supposed to be doing. And so um, it's been a it's been a huge help, but not as great of stories. So we'll see if in the next year we, uh, we have some good stories to tell maybe next year. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, Megan, I think anyone who's worked in staffing feels like they could write a book at this point of the crazy situations you hear about. I think from an imposter, imposter perspective, um, I've heard of groups of people working in the same apartment, like 
all collectively working contracts in some way, shape, or form. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it's always, they always get caught and it's deny, deny, deny until finally it is, you know, admitting of what happened, right? They, it wasn't them in the interview or it was them in the interview and now they're outsourcing the work to somebody else. So lots of crazy experiences, but I think Megan, you might take the gig. <laughs> so Marin, has this changed uh, from your experience with any of your programs, how my managers approach this? Are they sort of exacerbated and throwing their arms up? Or are they Are they doing things differently? Yeah, you know, I think we've seen managers really embrace uh, the video interview. I think, unfortunately, in a lot of cases, it doesn't replace the in-person interview. Um, on the other hand, we've heard of companies that are completely doing away with the traditional multi-interview process just to address the tight candidate market we're in. So um, that's always the potential for imposters to kind of come through. But the pandemic's really caused everybody to have to be more agile and fluid in the way that they're um, attracting and retaining talent. But I think we've seen the more risk adverse of our clients um, have added either a step or added a control in place because this has just become so much more prevalent as we continue to be in a remote environment. You touched on something I just want to uh, punctuate, and that is um, companies saying, hey, we can't afford to take three weeks to get four or five managers schedules aligned to go through this linear screening process. Um, so we've seen sort of group interviewing happening more and also recording an interview process. And it could be a technical interview. It could be a technical coding exercise and allowing others to see it, you know, that same day, but on on uh, a different schedule so that they can get through that process much faster. And, um, you know, that's that's key as you have people who are getting offers quickly. And you, if you if you waste a day, you might lose a candidate. Um, so that's that's good to hear that uh, companies are adapting. Yeah, interview days are kind of the new the new thing, you know, yeah. Let's get everybody on the same page, knock it out and be able to kind of extend offers and move quickly. Yeah. So on the other side of, of the coin or, um, you know, the other cohort of folks are those who really are qualified and they, they have stellar resumes and work experience. They know their stuff um, and they're asked to take uh, a test to prove that. Um, James, are you having any um, any situations like that? And, and how do you handle that? What does your team tell those folks? We have two responses to it. Either they like it because they think they're gamifying the system and realizing, you know, okay, how did I do? Please tell me how I did. Or they're offended um, that you're asking somebody of their caliber to take the take the test. And I think our our answer and our response is pretty much the same, which is we're asking everybody to do that. Um, and if you move the baseline up, fantastic. Um, you know, just imagine the candidates that will come in after you. Um, but at this point, we're looking for everybody to have an assessment and have that on file so that we can at least um, utilize that in the interview process. We're not, again, we're not utilizing it for purposes of creating a gate at this point or any kind of, um, any kind of barrier to entry. What we're really trying to do is understand where they sit in the spectrum of other candidates that have come before them, as well as obviously folks that we've put um, out to work here in corporate or in the field. And so um, it, it is helpful. And I think what we've found with some of our quote unquote senior candidates is they don't score as well as some of the mid-level candidates because they're not as involved in that um, on a day-to-day -day basis in that role, in that skill, whatever, working with that skill, et cetera. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis as their uh, folks that are working for them. And so I think it's been interesting for them too um, to see an opportunity to at least expand their, um, you know, expand their overall skills and maybe get back into some of that. That's really interesting. That's an interesting dynamic I hadn't thought about that um, the more senior people may have, have moved into a tech lead role and not have been hands-on. And if they're being considered for more of a hands-on role or a tech lead role where they still have to know backwards and forwards what their what their teams doing in coding that they um, they would score less well than than those that have been more directly involved interesting yeah it's been interesting it's been fun though and I think we see a lot of can depending on the personality of course uh, but we see a lot of people that are interested in at least doing it for for purposes of their own self-assessment yeah yeah fantastic so um, Megan or Marin, is there anything that you've seen has worked well in these circumstances? Um, you know, Marin, it may be something you've heard that agencies supporting the program have done or Megan, something that you, that you your teams are doing to encourage those who are reluctant to, um, to just complete the test. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's all about how you approach it with the candidate, right? And I think what we find to be successful across our programs that implemented something like LIDAR is, it's part of the process. To James's point, it's it's not the first step to get you to submit it, right? If, if you're thinking you have to do this in order to get submitted, it, there's so many other opportunities out there. Why would you take an assessment when you can just put your resume out there? So really um, explaining the value and that there might be some extra time on the front end having to take the assessment and go through that. The rest of that process should be you know, speeding up essentially, right? The manager knows you have technical capabilities to meet it. In a lot of cases, it could just be a quick culture call to make sure you're a fit for the team and you're getting that offer. So, um, you know, the staffing partners really have to show that value, right? This is just part of the process. It's the first step. Um, and that's how they can combat some of that. Gotcha. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think the key for us is really just making sure we've got managers buy in first. So, um, you know, when we've got candidates that are uninterested in taking the test, we like to be able to have the conversation that managers are bought in. And this is generally the first round interview. Um, so it, to your point, kind of speeds the process and moves things through a little quicker. Yeah. So the other dynamic here is the remote workforce. And while it already had higher adoption, I'd say over the last certainly five years, um, pre COVID, COVID caused companies to virtually overnight change their work from anywhere policies, certainly for contingent workers, and even for employees, those that were reluctant to embrace a policy have, have had to. Um, so that creates new opportunities and challenges for finding talent. So um, you know, if I'm in the greater New York area, I can now consider a job in Denver if I wanted to, if I'm allowed to work on that job from home. And, you know, even in this greater New York market, um, if I have to work in midtown Manhattan and I live in, in Brooklyn, I might not want to take that job. Uh, but now that I don't have to commute every day, I can go into the office on occasion. So anyway, it, it opens up, uh, uh, hopefully broadens the, the workforce. Um, also creates challenges with managing that workforce and creates challenges with qualifying um, and screening the candidates uh, when they're they're not sitting in that room with you or that testing center. So, um, Marin, how's this impacted your your ability to to screen candidates who might have come in in person for an interview um, or might have come in in person to, to, to take a test? Um, has this um, made things easier? Has it made it more difficult? Yeah, it's definitely made it interesting, I will say. Um, so I think, you know, we really rely, I, I probably alluded to this several times, but from an MSP perspective, we really rely on our supplier partners to make sure that those candidates are being screened by the time they get to us, right? That they can do that role in some way. So whether that's using a technology like LIDAR, um, doing a traditional in-house, I don't know if this even exists anymore, um, but you know that they're doing some kind of screening on their end that by the time we get it, we know that they can effectively do the job. But I think, especially with COVID and what we're seeing, um, you know, I have found such value being a part of a company like the ADECO Group and having these family of brands like Modus and where Megan's team and my team, you know, we can pull up and say, what are the challenges that our clients are facing? And by putting our heads together, we can allow this kind of bigger thinking approach and we can go to our clients and say, here are some innovations that can maybe address this remote environment, whether it's a technology like LIDAR or it's um, analytics or something to that effect. Um, and that kind of helps us take them in this you know, race to fill seats that everybody's in. It's such a tight market and it moves more to the strategic, getting the right work done and helping them through this. So, you know, we've had to really be agile and change how we do things. And a lot of that is you know, collaborating internally to make sure that we're taking all the expert advice from our brands and bringing that to the forefront to our clients to make sure that we're adapting with them. Yeah, gotcha. And, and Megan, has this made your team's jobs easier or, or harder or both? <laughs> and have you seen, I'm curious, no. if you, I, was, I was just going to add, if, if, you're, if you've seen any customers uh, reverting back and maybe with Omicron, they reverted back again. It's a very uh, dynamic environment, but I'm curious if also companies start to say, no, now we want people to come, come in person and if that's created challenges as well. Yeah. So I think, you know, overall, the ability to source candidates really, it, this has made it easier, right? The ability to work anywhere. However, I think it's very industry and client specific. 
Um, from my vantage point, it seems like most of our engineering and med device clients really are still working on site, have, have worked on site through this. So that has been a bit of a challenge finding candidates or, you know, having to um, go through, you know, time off, that kind of thing. Uh, finance and insurance vertical really seems to be, you know, they're willing to have candidates work off site, but they want people in market so that when they do go back to offices, they can be face to face again. Mm. And then it seems like most of our high tech clients really have remained open to, you know, work anywhere environment. So it really is dependent on client industry, I think. Yeah. Uh, I remember uh, maybe six months into uh, the pandemic hearing companies and really big companies say we permanently switched to remote workforce. And I've worked long enough, 30 years into my career, that nothing is permanent <laughs> in corporate America. And that policy might change a year from now, but um, it'll be really interesting to see where things lie. I, I was on a panel earlier, or uh, listening to a panel rather, yesterday, and, and the question was posed, um, is this new dynamic here to stay, regardless of what the outcome uh, of COVID is in terms of how quickly that's not an issue anymore? And everyone universally said, regardless of COVID dynamics, um, it's here to stay. So I think it's uh, it's great that you're finding ways to um, make the most of that situation and leverage the benefits. Um, and so in screening candidates, you know, recruiters are often the first line of defense, right? So we they get on that initial call and you gauge interest and fit and those sorts of things, but then they in some cases have to be that front line of asking questions around, well, talk to me about how you've used you know, JavaScript and in, in, in this scenario. And, and um, while they're probably very good at understanding the differences between technologies, they're probably, um, because they've not been as hands-on, they're not able to ask that follow-up question or that second question or probe, or maybe the, the question isn't um, as uh, robust or detailed as it, as it should be. Um, James, uh, what are you hearing from your recruiters in terms of their their challenges and sort of weeding through what's real on a resume and what might not, might not be? And how do I feel comfortable moving this person on to the next stage with, with you know, my screening um, uh, capabilities? Yeah, well, I've always said, and I think I shared this with you, and it, it's not obviously rocket science what we do, but but um, but I always felt like recruiters needed to be an inch inch deep and a mile wide right, in terms of overall expertise and understanding of what um, clients were looking for and or their internal or external client was looking for. So I'm not expecting my recruiters to walk in the door, even if they've got 10, 15, 20 years of experience in the space and be able to give a, a complete Java exam and, and come out of that knowing um, uh, that this candidate is the best match for the role. In addition to that, how we use those technologies individually in groups, how hiring managers use those externally with clients, can be different. And, and so, um, you know, it's like agile, there's about 7 million versions of agile, right? So if it's how we use it internally and, and certainly fundamentals that are, that are standard. So what Glider has given the recruiters is the ability to ask in-depth questions and get a good solid answer, right? One or two different variations of, of a good answer is still a good answer and solid enough for us to move them forward with some confidence that they can still do the job. We provide that then to the hiring manager and allow them to see some of those answers and then incorporate that into their overall interview process um, so that um, they are looking at um, how they answered that question and maybe can follow up with a more in-depth question about here's how we're using it today, here's how um, you would be utilizing it in this role, et cetera, and how we could how we could pot potentially find the best candidate from that match. So it's given our recruiters the ability to be a little bit more confident in mm. their assessments, which is great, but it also gives our managers um, an assessment that they can use that then they can say, okay, and this, this is true externally or internally, but an assessment they can use to say, this is how we're using it today. You're using it in a different way. And maybe that's a beneficial thing and it creates a different kind of conversation during the interview process. Mm, yeah. Fantastic. So Megan, how are the recruiters at Modus doing? Are they uh, hanging in there with this? <laughs> It's tough. It's tough. But honestly, you know, our recruiters are amazing. Um, they have been so resilient through this pandemic. And Modus really has put a concerted effort and focus on personal and professional wellness during this time. So although the workload has, you know, absolutely increased um, and we've been hiring recruiters to keep up with that demand, the team really has embraced the spike in volume and we're just tackling it day by day. <laughs> yeah, good. 
Um, so, so Marin, I'll, the ideal scenario is you, you screen, you screen well, uh, the candidate gets on the job and they crush it. They just are fantastic. You want to keep them as long as possible. Um, the opposite side of that question is th they've slipped through a crack or two and, and they did great in that screening process, but really don't have the skills and they're not going to be successful in that role. And they're not. And, you know, you have unwanted turnover because you just say, look, we need somebody that can do these things faster, more efficiently, more productively, whatever it may be with higher quality. H how do you, when that happens, how are you measuring quality in your programs? I know it may vary based on customer and how they want to uh, measure quality, but quality of the worker is often a re retroactive thing that gets measured at the end. Um, have you seen any creative, innovative ways of measuring quality of the workforce? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the great resignation, right? And we've, we've been hearing so much about this as of late. And so it's really important for our clients that we're keeping a close eye on that negative attrition, whether it be a candidate resigning for their own reasons, or it's, um, you know, a performance related issue. So I think that's where we see that value in a glider assessment, right? We know that candidate coming in can in some way meet some of the technical requirements. But I think what we've seen, um, and it probably is not the first thing that people think about when it comes to quality and performance, but um, one thing that makes a big impact is that contractor care piece. So it's, a lot of companies are getting away from, you know, you get a body in the door and then they become a number and they go to the black hole of recruiting, right? They don't know if they work for staffing company X or client Y. Um, so having that consultant care and those regular check-ins, I think really help um, assess with quality and performance in real time. So um, having staffing partners check in, how is it going with the candidate, right? Is this you, the job you thought it was? Because then you can level set expectations and keep a happy candidate. Um, but from a manager perspective, checking in as a candidate is on assignment can really, in real time, if you're addressing performance issues, big or small, can really make the difference of perception of performance. Um, and just by tweaking little things as you're having those connects can make for a happy candidate staying on assignment um, and the end a happy client. And that's a win for everybody. Yeah, that's fantastic. I've, I've uh heard a lot of examples of, of organizations where they, they're so worried about co-employment that to the extent that they've been just sort of trained, in some cases uh, over-trained or trained <laughs> incorrectly to, you know, you can't give them a performance review, but that's translated into, okay, I can't give them any feedback. I have to call an agency and that agency has to give them that feedback. And I've worked with um, a particular attorney who's litigated these things in court. And he said, that is not an issue. There's about 50 other risks above that that are, are more important. And, and so providing that that feedback directly to candidates as they're doing the work um, is critical. So glad to hear that that's happening. So we've got about 20 minutes left. Um, I want to focus on sort of the bigger picture, right? So these are, you know, what are we doing today and what do we have to do tomorrow to tackle these challenges? But ultimately, there's lots of longer term, term solutions that are needed. I don't see this demand for tech labor abating anytime soon, if ever. I think it's uh, going to continue to be um, an up, up, uh, upward trend. Um, and so things like um, upscaling or rescaling um, are important. Um, companies, private sector working with, with educational institutions to tailor curriculum to be more uh, practical for hands-on needs, um, whether it's technology skills or not. Um, so I think, the, you know, these are the things I've heard some innovative solutions here. Um, Megan, you talked about Modus Academy. Um, talk to me a little bit about how that works. And, and I assume that you have people who are very eager to, to be a part of Mo Modus Academy because they are going to be a more qualified um, candidate when they're done with it. But do you have anyone who's sort of reluctant to go through that process? Yeah, so Modus Academy was really created um, with the goal of supporting our customers from a you know talent environment so that they're they're ready, right? We've got this skills gap that um, lots of eighty percent candidates, like I mentioned earlier, that we just you know there's that little piece that's missing. So really, we've got two primary approaches. We've got the upskilling piece where we're arming our existing associates with complementary skill sets to provide value. So again, that eighty percent fit. Um, and we'll fill that gap. So think of a Java developer that maybe needs Python training. We can get them trained so that they've got the skills needed. 
Um, and we've got the reskilling piece. So this is when there's more of a gap in the market. And I'm, uh, MODIS can identify candidates with a technical aptitude that we can then train from the ground up. Um, again, Java developers aren't in the market. It's really tough to find W2s out there. We identify candidates and we're actually creating the supply for the demand. So we've got lots of clients that engage with us and we partner with them to, you know, create a very customizable um, training program. It can be virtual, it can be on site. Um, we can do it for clients uh, for their current ex existing staff, or it can be for MODIS um, associates that are on site. And we have this for our associates that are just working for us. So maybe it's not a full blown academy program that we're actually setting up for a client, but our associates that are working for MODIS, um, we give them the opportunity to upskill themselves if they have that interest. So we've really found that it helps improve our fill ratios and our retention, and it's also helping our clients from a DNI initiative. Um, we're kind of creating environments that provide opportunity for high potential resources that um, can obtain those needed skills. So it's been a really cool program. We're excited about it. That's excellent. It just occurred to me that it might be a good solution for when someone is in their their quote unquote cooling off period in between assignments. So. If they're a yep. contingent worker and they've been there 18 months or 24 months or whatever a company's tenure policy might be, go, uh, if you're a full stack developer and you're you know weaker on the front end, go take some front end um, classes while, while you're in that cooling off period. That's um, yep. a, a lot of promise to, to the, these solutions. That's fantastic. So James, you're, you're recruiting for full-time uh, and, and contingent. Um, and again, I know you're, you're building as you go and you're iterating rapidly, I'm sure, but um, do you have any L&D initiatives ongoing to make sure that people as they're continuing their careers are upskilling themselves internally as they remain a drone up employee? Yeah, so the, from an L&D perspective, we, we're looking at all the traditional ways for you to utilize upskilling and, and move up in the organization. But we actually do have a university program, which um, we're excited about uh, to be launched here in May at a couple of our partner. Um, we've partnered with a few um, universities. So some of that's going to come out from an announcement perspective, but um, to allow us to take you know drone pilots for in, in particular and put them through a, an individual assessment on glider assess them through the um, through the uh, interview process and the talent acquisition process and then put them into a, a training program on the job training program to give them the skills necessary to do the job that we need them to do on the delivery side of the house. And so we're, we're excited about that. It sounds a lot like Modus Academy. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and so um, it is something that allows us to pick through candidates that as I mentioned earlier, primarily are in the um, maybe the side hustle space as it relates to dr flying drones and doing other things and 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 specifically skill them to be um, experts in what we're trying to have them do from a delivery side of the house. So we're doing a little bit of both from an internal perspective in traditional roles. We're looking at upskill and the capabilities that you have there within a startup environment that's growing quickly like we are. You obviously have a lot of opportunity to prove yourself out and 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 move up as you as you prove that you can either gain the capabilities necessary or have the skills and just maybe haven't used them in a in a uh, current environment that's a little less applicable outside um, in an external staffing environment obviously but it works really nicely here um, from a from a startup perspective and then we've got the LD group working on the university model which is which is also very cool fantastic I look forward to hearing more about that yeah. Um, so one of the other dynamics is, is looking for a population of workers that really maybe weren't paid enough attention to, frankly, and, and a huge one is, is military veterans. Um, and I know there's a lot of upskilling, reskilling training programs for military veterans. Um, I heard from a customer a week or two ago that um, there is a, a, an initiative, I think it's Department of Veterans Affairs has a tech training program, but that unfortunately, a lot of organizations, both federal government agencies and commercial agencies have education requirements. And so they get through this program, they're excited, they're skilled, and, and then someone dings them for not having a college education. So I hope that people rethink those policies as well, um, where it's appropriate. And if you can prove that you can do the job and have the skills you need that you don't also to have, have to have um, you know, a degree. Um, and that's so core to what Glider's values are, that we want competency, not credentials, to be the, 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 the reason why you are successful in your career. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, 
Marin, you you get exposed to a lot of different companies. Um, are, are you seeing that anyone's relaxing their education requirements um, for for resources where the sun? You know, this is now a nice to have an undergraduate degree or a degree in a particular tech, technical acumen is is nice to have as long as they can prove that they can they can do the job and they have the skills. Yeah, I definitely have seen it relax over the last few years. Um, I think when it comes into play is that conversion, right? If there's a company that does a lot of conversions, you have to align some of those specific skills, user experience, and in that case, maybe a degree um, if they're convert to a full-time employee. So there's some of those challenges still, but I think from a straight, this is true contract work, it's going to go X amount of time. Um, we have seen that relax a little bit. And to your point, I think that's great because I just think it used to be, you know, the bachelor's was kind of the baseline and then the master's was kind of the next thing. And I just really don't see that happening as much anymore. And um, Marin uh, or James, any any experience that, that you've had or, uh, you know, James, I don't know if this is a, a applicable in, in when you're going out to candidates for the roles and education requirements being nice to have or must have. Yeah, it depends on the role still, right? And it depends on sure. the hiring manager. But, you know, we are forcing people to look more at skills and look more at background and, um, and competency as opposed to those credentials. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, um, um, we we kind of look holistically at candidates, which is which is exciting. We don't get that. We didn't get that in my in our old role where I'm more focused on filling job needs for large uh, Fortune 1000 clients. You kind of have to go with what their what their hiring managers are looking for. Here we can challenge yeah. hiring manager assumptions. Um, you know uh, everything from price equals experience, right, which we've all um, had for years and years and years, to skills and background over credentials. And um, and so we definitely see it. We also, from a military perspective, we're a huge military employer and continue to um, look through how we can bring more and more of those individuals into this environment. We're obviously here in Virginia Beach um, today, but um, uh, we're going to be uh, around the country very shortly with, with some offices opening. But right now in the Virginia Beach area, we have a lot of folks that are leaving military and coming in. And we see that as a tremendously valuable um, background and applicable to a lot of different roles and specifically in our delivery um, side of the house because there's a lot of training there that comes along with that. So, I, yeah, I mean, I I think overall I'm seeing it less of a focus. Um, I've got a daughter in college, so who I'm paying a lot of money to go to college. So I hope <laughs> it matters at some point for her. But <laughs> but um, but anyway, overall, um, I always tell her, you know, it's going to be about how you do on the first interview and how, you, you know, from a personality perspective, how you're relating to the team, how much of a cultural fit you're going to be, and then how adept you are going to be at learning um, the environment and being somewhat um, uh, somewhat beneficial to the overall team that's going to matter at, at the end of the day. And they're not going to remember a year in that you have a degree from a great college. It's just going to be about what you've done for them in the last year from company perspective and help. So that, you know, as we continue to challenge hiring managers, both externally and internally, um, I think the next five years will prove that, um, you know, people will start looking less at those type of things and a whole lot more of their holistic background. Interesting. You know, I have a son who's graduating this spring from college as well. And and I remember telling him when he was probably, I don't know, eighth grade, maybe in early high school that I didn't he did not have to go to college if he didn't want to go to college. And there's lots of I've had lots of friends with businesses where they did not have a college degree, incredibly successful between peer pressure and just it is sort of the de facto. This is what you do. You, you go to high school, you go to college. Um uh, I know that's that's a reality, and I certainly same. You know, done done paying the college tuition. Um, glad that he, he did get a job. Thank goodness for this wonderful job market. Um, but uh, you know, I think that this is something that lots of people will have to rethink. Uh, and um, an interesting topic for sure. Um, so, with, with the time that we have left, we have about eight minutes, and want to make sure that people have time to get to the next session or their next meeting. Um, if anyone has a question from the audience that you want to pop into the to the Q and A, um, please do. And I guess we'll, it, I'll give it a minute to see if anyone does. And just say in closing, thank you all uh, for attending, um, and thank you to the panel for all of the great insights and um, examples of things that are working well in these challenging times. Um, so appreciate all of your time and focus. And I'll just stay on for a minute um, just to see if there's any questions that come in. 
and uh, otherwise we'll just get we'll give it a minute uh, or 30 seconds maybe and um, and we'll we'll wrap up anything else the panel wants to add I guess I'll say that as a filler <laughs> while we're waiting to see if any questions come in no pressure but uh, if anybody has any other thoughts jump on in Looks like there was a good frothy discussion going on among the attendees, so that's fantastic. Um, no specific questions coming in. So we'll wrap it up there. Thank you again for your time. Um, Megan, James, Marin, really appreciate it. This was a lot of fun for me, uh, and thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you.